it is now time to start this month's uh, NREL Zoom Track meeting. Welcome everyone, I'm glad you're here today. Uh, next month's meeting, put it on your calendar, is five weeks from today. It's a day you all love and fear at the same time. It's also tax day, uh, April 15th. So we have a nice program today, have six presentations. So we're gonna move right through them. The first one is, are some announcements uh, from, from NRAIL and Bruce, you're up for those. I wanna remind everybody that uh, our website has a lot of good stuff on it. Um, everybody should have gotten a notice about the new T-Track uh, recommended practices and we're asking people to respond. Uh, if you wanna find them on the website, you go to publications. And then under publications down here, it says proposed T-Track corner recommended practices. And you can click on that, download it, read it online, whatever. So that's out there. In addition, and if you go to the store, we are now starting to sell banquet tickets for Grapevine. We're gonna have a 50th anniversary banquet. Um, and we, uh, we expect to have a good turnout for that. You can go there. Uh, just a quick comment about the 50th anniversary cars. The first batch sold out quickly, but there are two more batches coming, one in conjunction with the National N-Scale Convention in, in Reno slash Sparks, and the second will be in conjunction with the National Train Show in Grapevine. So stay, uh, stay tuned for those. In addition, we have some specials out here. Uh, we try and change the special. So visiting the store is always a good idea. Remember, you as a member get a, get a discount. You'll notice underneath here, it says member price. Um, and I think that's just about it for here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the website for uh, NSCALE, National NSCALE Convention. And Dick, you want to make any comments or do you want to do share, screen sharing, whatever? Anyway, Dick, take it, take it away. Bruce had asked me to make some comments about the uh, uh, convention and I had a, a short little presentation. Is it okay for me to give a five, 10 minute presentation now, Bruce? Uh, five minutes would be great. Yeah. Rather than going through uh, day by day, what we're going to do, I thought it might be better just to show you what, I kind of like uh, one of one of the fun jobs. What I do is I get the opportunity to go out in October time frame in order to uh, see home layouts, which is the only opportunity I get during the whole convention to go do it. So I wanted to share something with you. Uh, in the northern part of the country, we have basements, so everybody's doing out of basement. But what I found out going down to Florida, going out west. It's in garages, and everybody's got something. In uh, in Reno, Sparks, and uh, Carson City, uh, we, there are about three or four N-scale uh, layouts. Uh, some are small, like this one, and it's located in a garage. Uh, but then this is also a garage. The fellow bought the house because it had something like a four and a half double car garage, which is rather large. And he was able to put together his layout in there. So we have small garages, large garages. And in to make him happy that this is the uh, backside of the garage where normally you drive in, which you can't do it because he's got the layout. So the wife took it over and she created a ghost town. That's her hobby. So that whole section there, she has parties and it's a ghost town which is interesting. Uh, again, this is another garage. And Skip and I were joined this year by Eric Smith. He came along with us. So his first taste of actually going out and seeing seeing home layouts this way. So he kind of enjoyed that. And I think he wants to do that in the future. Again, a garage. Uh, this fellow, uh, as we have Lionel, we have Engage, we have HO. This fellow has ON30. And it's remarkable what he's put together in his garage. Again, more garage. This couple, they used to be airline pilots. They had a G-scale layout in their backyard. 
and they got tired of trying to deal with the uh, weather and so forth. But they happen to own a warehouse. So downtown Reno, in their warehouse that they own, they set up a line L setup that we will be able to go see. Okay, come on. Now, these are the fellows that helped me with the uh, modules. It's called Mills Park. In Mills Park, they have a club. And that club has an engage layout and a big uh, HO layout. Uh, one of the things uh, that they're going to be hosting us there on Tuesday, and one of the things they asked was to bring their modules. Even though they have a club layout, they want to bring a module to uh, uh, the hotel. So they'll be on the other side of the nugget, and they're pretty good. Come on. Every time. Okay. There's Skip. That's, that's their club layout they have in Mills Park. Now, we have, as I said, some of these fellas have not, not, not so much scenic, and others have very scenic. This fellow here, he's been working on this for years, and it's a rather large layout, and it's completely scenic. All the signals work. It, it's really a very, very nice layout. About eight miles away from Jim's layout is another Jim's layout. And Skip and I first went in there, and the fellow introduced us, and, and we went into his den, and he showed us this, which was uh, Oakland, California, beginning of his layout, where he had uh, had the uh, the bay there and uh, trains lined up. And at the end of this room, there was a hole in the wall, and he said, oh, no, come on in. That's my living room. This is his living room. Don't get confused by the right hand, the hole in the wall on the right hand side. That's not the entrance. Uh, he's showing us this layout here, which is rather extensive. And then I said, well, where does this go? Where does that hole lead? And then he started to explain what he did. He got kind of carried away. That's his, that's where the hole comes out. He decided to expand a little. He built a room. That's 35 by 75 foot with a 25 foot ceiling on it. To the building inspectors, he just told them it was a garage. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see one of the double doors. The building inspector said, oh, come on. What are you really going to do? This is what he built. Uh, and it's eventually going to be two layers because what you see on the right hand side with the wood up high that is a deck which you can walk up on and look down at the layout. From the deck looking down, this is what he's got all over the place. And it's rather an extensive uh, layout in there. Um, it's not scenic. And he's got something like close to, he says he's got 900 turnouts on this thing. So it's rather expensive. extensive. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what sort of home layouts I get to go see during during my stay in here. And in this particular case, uh, it was a local NMRA fella that I happened to network with that said, gee, I have some layouts. Would you like to see ours? And they do something on a regional basis, like once a year, and there's over 19 different homes that open up to have home layouts. So that's it for me. If there's any questions, you can ask them. Okay, let me get that out there. How many of them are HO and N scale? Uh, yeah, I still have that on there. Uh, in the area right now, there are about five N scale layouts. But because of vacation, because of other things, we're only going to visit three of them. All the rest of them are going to be HO. Well, I hope that fellow that's working on that big one is is young. <laughs> we'll never get it done. <laughs> he's 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 an interesting fella. He's 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 worked for the railroad. He's done a lot of things in his life. And uh, let's put it this way: he, his house is on a five acre plot that Skip and I had a, a devil of a time trying to find. And we went down the driveway, and at the end of the driveway, before we get out of the out of the car. We had a bunch of uh, Mustangs surrounding us. Wow. Um, yeah, they're wild. And 
uh, they're kind of starving and always thirsty. So he sets out water and they show up. So we had to make our way past the Mustangs to get to his front, front door to get in the place. But uh, yeah, he's got a lot. Well, it's of- another thing to look forward to. And it is an extra cost item at the, uh, at the convention. And you need to register for that early in order to give on the bus for that. Isn't that not correct, Dick? That, that's correct. That we, This year, we're going to have three days of home layouts, but each day is going to be another set of home layouts. So in order to see all of them, you have to sign up for all three days. All right. Sounds, sounds very interesting. Next on our agenda is Showcase Miniatures. Debbie Vale and and her crew uh, have some things they want to show us. So, Debbie, if you're here, take it away. Yeah. Can you hear us now? Yes, we got it. All uh, right. This is this is not uh, something usual for us to do, but we're glad to be on with you guys talking. Uh, we don't do this very often. So, uh, yes, um, I typed the. We do know how to spell, but I typed <laughs> the I typed the, the name in wrong <laughs> up there. We, we see it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're just just busy working on a few things. Nothing, uh, a whole lot going on. We continue to add to our <clears throat> line of signals um, <clears throat> and vehicles. So, um, it, anything? Uh, can we share a screen with the latest vehicle that came out yesterday? Certainly. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> This is a remake of our um, number 14 tanker truck that I originally did for Joe Warren, you know, years ago, decades ago. And we just just recently updated the um, the, the kit. We've added a 3D printed um, cab with a resin cast tank, uh, photo etch details, a uh, lot of updates to it. The wheels are positionable. Yep, you front. Can rotate the wheels. That's kind of standard for our newest, newest products. And see that that was that was yesterday. We just put that out. And uh, this is one of our one before that. It's a Ford seven hundred and fifty uh, grain truck. You're now offering some of your products uh, painted, aren't you? That's correct. Yeah. We are. We got one of our one of our uh, workers here uh, is is doing some painting. That's been become kind of popular. Yeah, it, that's me. My sister. She she and her husband work here in the spin cat. He, uh, he runs the spin caster, and she comes and does inventory. And um, we hope to have some new in scale signals out too. I don't know. You know, our signals tend to be the best sellers um that we have and i think that they're that's because they're hard to reproduce by all these people everybody with the 3d printer um because we use different mediums we use um uh spin casting uh metal materials we use um uh photo etch uh we have our own way we can photo etch our own products now um we um and we have laser printers and 3D printers, and we incorporate all the different mediums to produce a kit, which, okay. you know, some things are hard to reproduce in one medium, and then we use another to make it better. So um, the photo etch um, has been a uh, challenging um, effort for us. We, uh, we got that, the, all of that equipment in couple of years ago but it's been it's definitely not uh cut and dry it's constantly changing you know with temperature and and the the chemical strength and it, in it and we have a huge room for that which we um thought we might do a video to show people how all of that's done because i think it's very interesting to watch and even in the failures you, you know, I thought we could do a video even if the product failed, which we have that happen quite often. <laughs> yeah, and um, big learning curve. Yes, it's definitely a learning curve. It takes a lot of time, a whole lot of time. It's just something that is hard to reproduce and, and get right. But 
we, we'll probably do a video about that. And yeah, we sure is there open. any questions yeah. uh, y'all might have or of us? Any we, we do have one on the chat line. Uh, Frank wants to know if the tankers will be issued as an undecorated scheme as well as a painted kind. Well, they they're, they're, as kits, so the decal comes with it. They can be used or not used. That that's showing the a build up of the kit. Uh, okay, but he cut yes, right. One of the things that I've always thought it was a conundrum in in our business is the most popular age for model railroading is transition era in the '60s. Yet, particularly in N scale, there is a dearth, total almost total absence of automobiles of that era of the 50s and early 60s. Uh, do you have anything on your pallet in the way of passenger cars or to, so we can so we can stock a town or a parking lot? Well, um, of course, anything's anything's can be on the on the on the list, of course, but um, there are some sources for the cars like that uh, online is at Shapeways. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Um, Rapid Pro makes a, you know, a couple of thousand cars, and they have just about everything you want in, in uh, as a Shapeways 3D print. Um, yeah. So that probably the first place to go. That's the place I would recommend to go. Very good. Uh, well, you got anything else we need to do right now? If not, we'll move right on, and we'll everybody knows uh, if you want to post uh, your contact information on the chat line. People that have additional things they want to ask, you can ask on chat. And if you'll monitor that through the show, uh, through the rest of the program, maybe you can uh, put the answers on the chat. Uh, Absolutely. We sure can. We're, we're signed in a couple of places. We had to do this a couple of ways with the phone, and we don't have the video set up on the computer yet, but uh, we'll try to do that for next time. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Let's you for letting us, letting, us, letting us be on. All right, so the next thing uh, on our agenda is uh, one of our standard guys who has always got something new and interesting to say, and that's Terry Moore, who likes talking T-Track. Terry, what's going on up in the far north woods? Hello, everybody. Talking T-Track. This time it's uh, about a little bit of track surgery. Uh, seems to be a popular thing to do. I think I found a different way of uh, achieving similar results. A beneficial accident may mean that track surgery to create 447 millimeter curves may not be necessary. Is this a junction <laughs> or a disaster waiting to happen? Yes and yes. This is what happens when two CMR style junctions are placed back to back and I continue drawing. It was very surprising how simply it came together. The CMR style junction is 926 millimeters long, just four millimeters shy of a triple straight module. This supercross is 926 millimeters square. As a result, it's a perfect companion for large corners with 447, 480 millimeter radii curves and the CMR junction they mate with. The corners are no sharper than those of the junctions. Now I just need to figure out what is needed for occupancy protection to avoid those possible disasters. <laughs> or maybe I won't. Super Duper 8. A friend of mine has a T-track display that uses a double track 90 degree diamond, similar to this, without the diamond junction corners, just a straight diamond. His Super 8 is created with standard corners and junctions and is fully controlled by occupancy for detection. Any number of straight modules are added, creating a long clover leaf with one large outside loop and one corner is replaced with a junction leading to the rest of the layout. It's a great crowd pleaser it shows as spectators wait to see if the trains will crash. I didn't intend to create a Super Duper 8. The hope is to create a combining junction between four large independent loop layouts. And again, that sort of led to an accidental improvement. 
Although the CMR large junction design was the best match yet developed for the large 480, 447 millimeter radii curves, I never really liked the corners and the two small pieces of straight track required. So I took the curve track from the Supercross, replaced one number six turnout with the equivalent 718 millimeter radius 15 degree corner, and an accidental improvement resulted. And this is just drawings proving how everything fits together. Mating the modified CMR junctions with the large 480, 447 millimeter radius curves proved the removal of a small fudge factor created in the original design at the nose of the junction. The difference can be seen in the graphic on the previous page and this little thing I added to this page. In short, all three pieces, the large corners, the modified junction, and the supercross fit together perfectly. Applying it to corners, these corners use the same track as the junctions, except that the number six turnout is replaced with an equivalent 718 millimeter 15 degree curve. Why? Two reasons. One, some folks don't like the super elevated corners. Two, since Cato does not manufacture 447 millimeter radius curve track, and we'll continue from there. Large corner options. First of all, this new corner design is not better. It's just different. Again, it provides an option to the 447, 480 super elevated tracks. They are similar to the large junctions, the same if you accept my junction track changes. For those who wish to eliminate the super elevated track, the 481 15 degree curves could be used for the outside track, but Cato does not have 447 millimeter curves yet. Kind of hope they will make them because we do have the 481s that they could work with. This new design uses the exact same track for both the inner and outer corners. The outside corner uses the 33 millimeter straight track trick to maintain the 33 millimeter track spacing. Okay, why apply this design to large corners? Why do we need options? Using the 484-47s, we don't. But, okay, why? To create escape tracks. A past NREL newsletter article promoted escape tracks leaving the yellow inside loop to create a red line only set of modules for operations. In order to do that with large corners, the 480 millimeter curve track was cut off. Why? Again, Cato does not manufacture 447s. Also, in a past newsletter, the same track surgery was performed to create curve track needed for a large junction design. And once the 480 millimeter curve track is cut off, which is not that easy, then what? Roll it away? You could make single track corner for the other end of the red track operations loop, but most folks want double track. Why again? To save money. The 718 15 degree curve track pieces come in packages of four. You need four for a pair of 90 degree corners. The 315 15 degree curve track pieces come in packages of four. You need four of them too. The 348 30 degree track pieces come in packages of four. You only need two of them, but you could use the other two to make another pair of corners. Using 480, 447 super elevated curve track, you will need two sets of easements and one package of two 480, 447, 45 degree curves. Or one set of easements could be replaced with another package of curve track. 
According to a large wholesaler slash online retailer, the super elevated track costs more than the other trackage listed here. And the 480 millimeter track removed may wind up in the garbage. Another why? To keep the outer curve. Okay, now what? If the inner corner has already been created with the 447s cut off, you can add number six turnouts and give the red track an option of escaping or avoiding the red track extension. Except for the addition of the 33 millimeter straights, this mimics the large junction design. Or there is an alternative. The number six turnouts are preferred, but the number four turnouts could be used with a bunch, actually 10, of the 481 15 degree curve track pieces mimicking the removed 480 millimeter trackage. Another why <laughs> to keep the outer curve with all flat track or without the bother of cutting up and disposing of half of the super elevated track pieces. No matter what is decided, the modules are the same size and there are no fudge factors. Oh, uh, <laughs> my buddy Columbo, just one more thing. About those large junctions, commonly known as branch line junctions, with that second run through straight track. They seem to cause a lot of trouble because people are so used to the Jackson junctions, which do not have that straight track. So therefore there's never any electrical issues. With these new large junctions, with the what I call the run-through track, to prevent possible electrical faults between the two adjacent inner loops, the large junctions with the straight track between the curves must have a track break in both rails somewhere between the curve turnouts. That can be either a pair of insulated unit joiners or a double crossover that has a design break in the middle between both left and right tracks. Or if you've already created the junctions, you can take a hobby tool and cut a gap in it. Why is this required? Because the inside, the white rail of the yellow track is continuous, joining the left and right loops together. As a result, both loops would need to be of the same electrical condition, that being DC, DCC or blue, white, white, blue standard wiring practice or yellow bus reversed, blue, white, blue, white to prevent electrical faults. This is the purpose of the supercross. This shows four independent loops allowing trains to stay in their home loop or traverse the other loops as desired. All red tracks would be DCC. The inner loops could be as desired. If you don't want to listen to me prattle on and playing this on YouTube, talk and key track presentations are now available to members on the nrail.org website on the tips and techniques page in the PDF format. If you wish to save a printed file that you can refer to at any time. Thanks for watching. We still have two more presentations to go, and we're right on schedule. We've got about 30 minutes left. Our next presentation will be by Lee Cawkins. Lee is, uh, has already given us an introduction to his Farragut loop, and he's going to update that on the status. And uh, so we're going to, again, in about 15, 20 seconds, after you get your water, stood up, set back down. Uh, Lee, just take it away when you're ready to go. So actually, this is the the third presentation. I did the first one back in August, and then I did another one in January. So um, the first presentation, I talked about how where Farragut Loop Farragut is. Farragut's a naval base in northern Idaho, um, Washington, Montana. Farragut's right there at the star. It's at the south end of Lake Ponderay. It was used during the 40s as a naval training station for naval recruits for World War II. Um, here's a gurgle earth view of the current 
status of the loop. You can see the loop still does exist. The scars are there in the land. Um, this is a, an image that they have in the museum there showing the, the track layout. And I tried to follow that as best I could as I went through this. So this part of the presentation is about building the module frames and getting them on legs and, and how to store them and, and move them around. So first of all, I draw everything in AutoCAD. Um, so I get all the correct measurements. Um, you'll notice with this image here, when we actually get to the regular, the real thing where I built it, it's slightly different. Um, I'm a great at drawing pictures. I'm horrible at execution. So there's some fudging factors when you're building 11 different modules. I've got an angle wrong somewhere, but it all works together and fits together. Uh, I built it as different modules. So a module is a Fremo N module um, right there. This module is made of four sections and this module is made of two different sections. And then I've got five 45 degree corners that are each a Fremo N module in and of themselves. Now, how do you build a Fremo N module? Um, there's a diagram online that shows what the end plate is supposed to look like. It needs to be three quarter inch birch plywood or something really equivalent to it. I've got friends that have tried to use dimensional plywood or dimensional lumber. It doesn't work. I know another guy who tried to use quarter inch plywood and then reinforce it. It did not work that way as well. Um, highly recommended you get a hold of some good quality plywood, birch, birch plywood. And this is this diagram is just one way to build a module. Um, this is a, a module by my friend Eric, and his is all uh, plywood top. And he's cut out for where his, for his, um, I think he's got a lake that goes right there. Here's an underside of someone else's module. He's done three quarter inch sides and he's done a half inch plywood top on top. And then he's got some half inch cross members underneath to help support the top. Um, this one's more of the same, but this guy is using the three quarter inch plywood and then he's drilled holes through all this because he's got a lot of electrical that went into these modules and he wanted lots of pass throughs to keep the wiring out of the way. Um, it has a, I think a one inch or a two inch uh, foam top that he decided to put on the tops of these. Um, this is another friend of mine. His name is Mark Watson. And his modules are going to have a, a two inch top of foam on top. But the side frames are made out of five millimeter plywood so that he can get a curve around on everything. So it gets a nice curved shape and everything is looks really well and flows really nice. Um, this is another module by Joey Broadstone up in the Minnesota area. Um, he's cut a plywood top for it, and then he built the frame underneath to support the top, and he's got his six-inch end, end plates on there per the standard. Um, this is a, another friend of mine. His name is Glenn, and he's going for a lightweight version, and he has built um, a framework just like you'd see in steel beams for all the side rails, and then he's going to set a foam in there on every side of the, the rails. Uh, this is another five millimeter birch or five millimeter plywood version of a module. Um, this guy is putting a river down the center and he's decided to go with double track. And so he'll have a track down either side of the river as it goes through. And he built a, a section of six of these modules. So, um, and then this one is another where he's cut the plywood up and uh, just laid it out a typical um, cookie cutter style module and then he fills the sides in with foam. And here's another one where it's all plywood all around the outside and filled with foam. And I think this next one is by Gordy Robinson and he's got a 3D printed module. He's trying to get a, a small module packed in a suitcase to bring from Orkney in the United Kingdom over here to Dallas. And so this is one of his modules that he is, is building. Um, he's really reinforced the ends for the clamps. So when we clamp this whole thing together that we don't break the 3D printed. And he's he's posted this design on Thingiverse and you can go look at it and download it from there if you wanna try it on your own. 
So for me, I decided to go with um, three quarter inch plywood or three quarter inch boards everywhere, uh, four inch side rails and six inch um, top rails or six inch end rails. Um, so these are all the parts and pieces I need if I was gonna build a four foot by 18 inch module. And if you notice um, my, the purple end frame here isn't quite 18 inches wide. It's one foot, five inches and three quarters. That's because I do add a eighth inch mason, I face it to it. So the overall width is 18 inches. So I calc all that in before I start anything. Um, again, I draw all these pieces in AutoCAD. Um, I figure out all my angles. I figure out how long every piece is. And you notice I've got a measurement on the inside angle and the outside angle. There's a lot of 22 and a half degree bend or cuts in this because it is a 45 degree module. Um, there's the, the little triangular module that goes in the junction. That module didn't turn out as planned, um, but I'll get there in a moment. Um, there's one of the rectangular modules, and here's the other rectangular module. A lot of them are the same size, so I didn't draw every single module out. I just drew the basic ones out. Um, here's all my wood. I went through and I cut out all the pieces. Um, first, I go buy a four by eight sheet of plywood. I rip it down to a six inch stock and then a four inch stock in my table saw, or you can get the panel um, jig and use a skill saw to do that. Um, I measured everything out, made a cut list and I got it all cut out into pieces. I've got lots of little braces and corners for supporting um, and making sure that everything stays square and true. I got everything cut out and then I set it on the floor in the the location of where it's gonna end up in the construction of the module to make sure that I've got all of my parts and pieces. And as I went through this, I actually shot videos and I've been posting those videos online on my YouTube page. And I should have one right here. So here's a video. Let's see if you guys can hear it. Um, Razor, nod your head if you can hear the video. No, I cannot hear the video. Ah. No, nope, here's why. Yeah, turn off that little mute. There you go. All right, back to the beginning. Still don't hear it, Lee. Mm. Apparently it's not broadcasting across the channel. I can hear it in my ear. Anyway, um, talking about how the naval, the naval base, what I've told you already, but here's all the dark parts and pieces. Get everything laid out on the ground. So the end towards me points towards Athol, Idaho, which is the main part coming into the loop. So um, we got the passing sidings go on the side modules here and come around the outside. And those are all the 45 degree modules. And then coming down here is the industrial modules. So for me, I go through and I use, make sure I've got a good layer of wood glue in there. And then I've got an air nailer and I'll put in staples to keep everything nice and tight and true. And then I will follow up with a 5 8 inch screw that I pre-drill to make sure that just everything stays together. So I glue it and I screw it and I nail it together because I don't want this to move. This module is gonna get used and moved around. Um, this summer it's going to Reno, Nevada and to Dallas. So I need it to be solid. For the legs, I'm using a piece of, um, plastic PVC pipe and two pipe brackets and a thumb screw to hold the leg into position. And I'll get into what material I'm using for legs a little bit later on in the presentation. I, I pre-drill the pipe. Um, when I get everything attached, I'll put the thumb screw through the pipe. Um, actually, now I'm actually drilling through the metal bracket instead of just the plastic like that, that way I get a little more bite into the steel of the, the bracket. 
when I put it together. So I'm drilling through the bracket there. And then I actually have a, a threader and I will thread through the, through the metal and through the pipe for my thumb screw. And the thumb screws just hold on to the pipe like that. You can see I'm using a piece of um, EMT conduit. I have, that what, that's what I was gonna use when I first started this project was EMT conduit. conduit. Um, I don't like the weight of that. I was trying to get to a lighter weight. I've actually switched to a different material for this set of modules. Um, I went through and I built all the side rails for all of my um, rectangular modules first so I could get all these um, leg clamps in there or leg brackets. Um, I've got the, they're not quite triangle, they're trapezoid pieces on the end so I can square up the end of my end plate when I build the, the entire module. So there's the end plate, I'm about ready to attach it. Um, I've nailed it and I've glued it and I'm going to put in a screw into the triangle piece and then into the side rail. Um, on some of the modules, the two industrial yards, I am putting down a piece of three quarter inch plywood because I had it to mount the track to. Um, the parts that don't have the plywood on it right now will get filled in with um, two inch blue foam, which you can see in the back of the picture stacked up on the freezers behind it. For the 45s, I went through and I laid out a jig um, so I could put in all the 45s to the same, make sure everything was held straight and true as I went. Um, I started with the end plates um, and then I got the other plates in place. And once I got it all together, I nailed it and I screwed it and I glued it all together. I then, um, the trapezoids on the sides are to hold the leg pockets. And the ones on the ends are actually to keep and make sure that the track at the end of my module doesn't bow or sway or sag or whatever and cause a ski jump at the end of the module. How do I hold my modules together? I use 11 inch vice grips. And you'll see that when we actually flip to assembling the, the layout, I've got the 11 inch vice grip right there and right there. And those are really nice because it's not a C-clamp. The C-clamp takes time to, to twist on every time. And the vice grip, if you never adjust the tightness on it, you just clip it on and you and it clamps the modules together really tight. And to take it off, to undo it, it's just pop the, seat, the vice grip off and off we go. So as we're building around the layout and adding these 45s in as we go, So there's four of them. There's 90 degrees of curvature. And there's all five of those 45s already completed. Um, you'll see off to the side here, my credit card apparently. Um, one of the modules has track on it already. When I started this build, I was gonna build the modules one at a time and then I changed plans after I got the first ones built and decided to build the rest of them all at the same time. So now we're starting to add in the main yard out towards the out towards Athol, Idaho. Um, after I got to this point, I threw a level on just to make sure that everything was still trending in the direction that I wanted and everything was level. Um, here you'll notice that that triangle piece that I originally had planned, that gap turned out to be a little further than what I was expecting. It's actually six inches right there where these two pieces were supposed to be flush with each other. And that's probably you know a half a degree on every 45 degree corner adds up to six inches when you come around to that many corners. But fortunately, I took that opportunity to just build that little triangle piece in place. And so here's another video of that showing the mistake that I made here. So everything is up and running. And so I'm talking about how I have this little difficulty right there. It was wider than I expected. So there's that. Now for leg pockets, there are several different ways. I showed you the PVC pipe version. These are a, a 3D printed version of a leg pocket. Um, these, these particular files aren't available online, but there are other files on Thingiverse under Nscale Tony. Um, 
and he has some nice pockets for doing three quarter inch EMT legs and also half inch EMT legs. And that's what it looks like when you throw the leg in there and mount the pocket in the corner. Um, it comes with a foot design. Both styles do come with this, the foot designs. So you can either choose this one. For me, I ended up going with uh, three quarter inch dowels. And I started a pilot hole in the end of the dowel. Um, I used a 16 penny nail to start that pilot hole. I then drilled it out. Um, the walls are getting kind of thin and that does concern me. I may reinforce it with a piece of three quarter inch EMT about three inches long. But as for now, I'm using a threaded in insert and I have wrapped everything in duct tape to add some structural stability on the ends of the legs. So there's all my legs with the bolts in them. They're adjustable at least an inch in either direction. Our setup height for Fremo N is 50 inches. And just in case, there's a picture of the, the modules up on legs. Um, this was set up last weekend in Spokane. So the loop is operational. I've got all the buttons done and we'll, I'll get into the electrical and the track and the joints and that on, on subsequent uh, Zoom track episodes over the next probably year. Um, to store the modules and ship the modules, um, I like to use end plates. And these are the end plates that I'm building. They're 12 inches wide because that's how wide my modules are and they're 18 inches long. I'm cutting out the middle portion to use as a handle also so that my track doesn't rub on the end plate when it's in the pack position. So I'm cutting out the middles with the jigsaw. Um, here's a pile of them after they're finished. I forgot to get pictures of when I was drilling them all together. But in the car, that's how they stack. I'm using a, I think it's a 5 8 bolt. And then I'm using a T-nut in the module so that we just bolt it into the module and the plates are protecting it like that. And um, there's no end plate rubbing on the track of the module. It is safe from any jostling and movement. And it allows us to stack modules on top of each other. Right now, none of these have the fascia on them. And you can see some of the wiring that goes into the, the modules. Now, again, we'll get into that more in a, a later Zoom track. So here it is running and operational. Um, this is last week. We got four guys with trains on that module right there, all running trains on it. So that's the current state of it. If you want to see it scenic, I will have it scenic in Reno. And the two straight portions of the module will be um, in the convention layout, not at the National Train Show, but in the convention layout at the NMRA convention in Dallas. So that's all I've got, Razor. Thank you very much, Lee. All right, we're gonna move on to our last presentation where we kind of, Lee's talking about his legs, leads us right into the next thing because Another Lee, Lee Williams out of Oklahoma City, has a, another way to put legs under an in-track module so you don't have to get down the ground when you're old and your knees don't work. So Lee, tell us all about how, to, how old people can do legs. Okay, I'm unmuted. You can hear me now. Let me go yes. ahead and do my screen share. This is my uh, briefing on threaded wood track in-track modules. And I have to give credit where credit is due. I tend to build on other people's ideas. And this is something I built on uh, a, a concept that came up with Kim Sane and Dave Andrews came up and I've kind of built on it. Here's a blueprint for what I'm building on a, uh, a wood threaded leg. And I show it on the uh, left here. It's a uh, inch and a quarter dowel uh, with a three and three quarters inch of six threads per inch uh, um, uh, threading. And uh, the total length is 38 inches, and then be screwing them into a block of uh, made with oak uh, boards, uh, some one by threes and a, and a half inch by three, uh, with an inch and a half of threading and uh, two inches of just an inch and three eighths space. Uh, the 38 inches comes as follows: um, the in-track specifications is for 40 inch top of rail plus or minus an inch, which means you need to be able to get the layout down to 39 inches. 
And from that, I subtract an eighth inch for track, eighth inch for uh, cork roadbed, uh, allow for a half inch of plywood, a quarter inch chair glide, and that comes out to a 38 inch dowel length. Okay, tools you're gonna need. Uh, here's uh, uh, some pretty standard carpentry tools, a carpenter square, some clamps, sanding block, an orbital sander, a ruler that's at least 38 inches long, pencil or sharper, Sharpie, a hammer, a drill, and you're gonna need a 564 drill bit, some countersink drill bits, a screwdriver bit, uh, a workbench with a vise, and a rubber pad. Uh, you'll need a miter saw or a chop saw. You'll need a drill press with a drill press by vise and uh, Forstner bits, or Forstner bits, uh, one and three eighths and one and an eighth inch bits. Uh, and then finally, the main tool is a wood threading kit for an inch and a quarter dowel and six and three uh, six threads per inch. And this is something you can order through Amazon. That's how I got mine. And one thing to note about the uh, the wood threading kit is that the uh, blade for the box cutter, the, the cuts or the the die that cuts the threads and the legs, is actually adjustable. There's a five eighths inch bolt, and you can. Uh, which clamps the um, the blade, and the blade is is right here where I'm pointing, and you can adjust how deep the threads are cut, and then tighten the um, uh, the bolt back up to hold it in place. Materials. Well, you got to start with some inch and a quarter dowels. Uh, mostly they're made of poplar and 48 inches long. Um, and one thing I've discovered is you'll notice on my pictures. Some of the uh, dowels threaded really nicely, as you can see on the left, and others chipped, and this is one that's chipped particularly badly. And I'm trying to figure out why some dowels work so much better than others, and I finally came across weighing them and discovered it had to do with the density of the wood, it appears. So what I did was I ordered a, a pocket um, food scale, and it's about the same size as my cell phone, and I take it into the home building store, and weigh the dowels uh, before I buy them and make sure that all the dowels that I buy are at least 18 ounces. And that seems to cause the, uh, uh, the wood threading to go much more smoothly. Uh, then I need oak boards. Uh, basically, uh, 40, for one module, you need 40 inches plus uh, blade widths, just buy a, a four foot long piece of one by three. And you need 10 inches plus blade widths of a half inch by three. And of course, the one by three is actually three quarters by two and a half, and a half inch by three is a half inch by two and a half. And you'll need some chair glides uh, that you put on the bottom of the uh, of the legs. Okay, and then we need some boiled linseed oil. You can get that from most hardware stores, and some wood glue. And I've got some inch and a quarter wood screws. Now. To start building the legs, the first thing you have to do is soak the end of the leg in linseed oil overnight and get as much into the, uh, uh, into the pores of the wood as you can, of the grain of the wood. And the way I do this is I take my rubber pad and I uh, put the linseed oil in a little peanut butter jar on the floor and stick the, uh, the dowel in and then clamp a, a clamp above it to hold it and then let it soak overnight. And the next day, the next thing I do is I take the uh, soaked um, end of the uh, dowel and I bevel it with the orbital sander. And this helps the threading get started when you cut the threads. And here's uh, where I take a, uh, the uh, dowel and clamp it with the now the soaked end up uh, into the clamp on the, on the uh, workbench. And then I cut the threads by rotating the thread box clockwise with just a little bit of downward pressure. And you can see it cutting the, uh, the, the thread, how it cuts the threads. And I cut the threads so that it protrudes three inches above the top of the thread box, which gives you four inches of threads on your, uh, on your leg. After that, put it back in and soak it for a little while in the linseed oil again to help strengthen the uh, threads because the, uh, the overnight soak doesn't really quite soak the linseed oil all the way to the full depth of the threads that you're cutting. After that, you'll notice that 
the very beginning of the threadings before they really get going, where you've got the, the guides in the thread box to uh, uh, get the right threads, you can get a little bit of uneven thread as shown in the red circle there uh, at the beginning of the uh, cutting the thread. So to eliminate that, I mark a quarter inch and then cut it off with my uh, miter saw. That's leaving three and three quarters of an inch of, of uh, threads as shown in the diagram at the beginning. Then I'll mark the dowel at 38 inches and then cut it again to the right length. And then bevel both ends of the dowel at that point. And then I'll mark the center of the thread. That's uh, five eighths of an inch from the uh, edge and mark the center and then drill it with a 564 drill bit and then tap in the uh, chair glide. And I like to use a rubber pad under the chair glide when I do this just to help protect the, uh, uh, the other end of the uh, leg when you're putting the chair glide in. And here's the finished leg. And I've got a close up of both ends of it. Uh, with both ends beveled a little bit, uh, help the thread in helps make it a little easier to start uh, screwing it into the module, and the other end just makes it look a little bit nicer. Now for the blocks, how to make the blocks on the thing. We cut first thing is to cut the oak boards into squares. Each block, I need four one by three squares and one half inch by three squares, and I use a, a clamp and a, a little block of wood to get consistent size for cutting the um, thing. And I use oak because that makes a stronger thread uh, for the uh, block. And then we stack and clamp uh, the uh, blocks in two different types of stacks. One stack with two of the one by threes and another stack with two one by threes and the half inch by three and stack and glue those together and let them dry overnight. Then I need to drill a hole in each of these. Now, what I do is I take um, uh, the Forzner bit and the um, vice clamp in my drill press, and I adjust it so that when the um, uh, bit is all the way extended, my press goes two inches in the uh, in, uh, uh, length, that it comes up a little bit short about maybe an eighth of an inch or so short of actually having the um, drill bit cut into the vise. And you can see behind it, I've got a little scrap piece of quarter inch plywood that I use and make sure that the drill will drill into that quarter inch piece of plywood, but not into the, um, uh, the, the, the vise. I then uh, mark the center of, the, uh, of each of the blocks on one end and the first thing I do is I take the shorter blocks with the two one by threes and I'll drill an inch and an eighth hole in the center of the block. And note that I've got a little piece down here in the bottom. You can see that little piece of scrap one by four plywood so that I can drill all the way through the block without drilling into the vise. Then I take the inch and three eighths um, uh, Forstner bit and drill a hole through the larger blocks with the two one by threes and the half inch one. And the way I do this is I start drilling it without that uh, piece of scrap plywood and that won't quite go all the way through. So then I have to loosen the clamp, raise the, um, uh, the block and then put the uh, little piece of scrap plywood underneath it to finish drilling the hole, the inch and three eighths hole through the uh, larger blocks. After I have those holes drilled, I need to glue the two blocks together and I make sure that I get the uh, two holes to line up concentrically. And you can see the inch and three eighths hole on the top here and the inch and eighth hole on the bottom. And then I'll glue and clamp those two pieces together, which gives me my uh, three and a half inch high block, which is the length of the one by fours that are usually used for uh, the frame on an Intrac module. Now, once I, that glue has dried thoroughly, then I take the, um, uh, the block and put it in my vise on my workbench. Now, you notice that I've got the uh, part with the larger hole in the top and the smaller hole in the bottom, and I've got the clamp 
clamp so that the vice grips uh, clamp both of the two pieces uh, on the lower uh, clamp. And uh, it's also offset off to the center so that the hole doesn't come in directly on top of the screw and the clamp. And this is, you gotta make sure this gets clamped very, very tightly. And then I'll take the tap, dip it in a little bit of linseed oil, let the excess oil drip off. And then I'll put that tap into the, uh, the larger hole in the top of the, uh, of the block. And then for alignment, to make sure I get the uh, hole uh, cut straight, I took a little piece of plywood and cut a 33 64 hole in it. And I discovered that half inch was too tight and 17 30 seconds was too loose. And I had to order a 33 64 drill bit uh, from Amazon here to do this. And I'll put that um, piece over the top of it. And then I'll take a square and some clamps and make sure that I've got that uh, the shaft for the tap uh, perpendicular to the face of the wood there to drill a straight hole. And then I insert the cross piece uh, on the top and cut the threads by uh, pushing down and uh, initially to start with and rotating the tap clockwise. Now this is the most difficult part of uh, making these things. And it takes a fair bit of hand strength and you have to rest or maybe occasionally back the uh, it out part way uh, to make the first uh, tap cut through the, uh, 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 for the threads to cut through the lower inch and a half on that block. Uh, once you get to the point where the knuckle clearance and your cl uh, clamps is getting kind of tight, you can remove those clamps uh, that are holding that alignment block because at this point the threads have, have uh, gotten started and it'll, it'll just cut straight from there. After you make your first cut, you'll have a lot of wood uh, in your tap. So I use a toothpick and an old toothbrush to uh, clean out the debris from the, uh, from the tap on your thing. Now I discovered that, that the, uh, when I tried screwing the legs in after the first cut, it is still way too tight. And so I have to do subsequent cuts and I alternate which way I do it. So here I have turned the, uh, um, the block around so that the threaded part is on the top and I'll do another cut. And this is much easier because you've already started the thread cuts, cut out a little more threads. And I do this back and forth a number of times. In fact, recently I've been doing it six times, but after about three or four times, uh, and then you flip the block again, cut the threads in the original direction and repeat as many times as it takes. Uh, usually four cuts. Recently I've taken six cuts. Um, and clean up the uh, block the with a sanding block. And here's what the block looks like with the threads cut in the inch and an eighth hole. Uh, test fit the block. It sh should be able to screw the leg in until it's uh, flush with the top of the block. If the leg binds or squeaks, cut, do another cut in the threads uh, until you can get it where you can turn it in easily without much resistance all the way. Uh, and then the, finally, I go and I like to uh, flatten out because I, the uh, blocks don't always get exactly aligned. And I'll take my uh, miter saw and kind of smooth off the uh, sides with the uh, miter saw so they've got a nice smooth side. And this is what the finished block look, looks like. And this shows you how you can get two inches of leg travel on the block. The one on the left shows the leg all the way in with the with the uh, would be down at 39 inches on the layer height. The other one is about a mid position, which would be about 40 inches. And the last one shows how the block would be up at the highest height, which would be up around 41 inches on leg travel. And this is assuming a half inch plywood on your module. But you can get two inches of travel while having the uh, threads fully engaged in uh, the inch and a half of threading. And if need be, the block module can be raised a little bit more and still have the legs pretty stable. Installation. Now installing these blocks on the module, one thing is you have to do is you have to ensure that the blocks, the screws you use to mount the blocks do not protrude into the hole uh, that, you're, uh, that you have. And uh, that's why I use inch and a quarter number eight wood screws for a module with a three quarter inch framework. They won't extend and you want to align it so that you're about halfway between the hole and the edge of the block. 
I clamp it in both directions and make sure you put the threaded part on the, uh, on the bottom of it and that the top of the block is against the uh, bottom of the plywood sub road bed. And then I'll mark uh, where to install the screws uh, about halfway between the edge of the block and the edge of the hole. And I do usually do diagonally opposite and I do four screws, usually two on one side and two on the other side. I like to use a pilot hole with a wood screw, and you notice this one's adjustable, and I adjust my pilot screw to be the same length as the uh, hole, and then you just drill that pilot hole uh, into the thing and then drive your screw in. Once the block is, uh, is uh, uh, screwed onto the uh, module, do a test fit, and make sure that you can screw the leg in all the way and that nothing interferes with the threads. Okay, and here's the advantage. During setup, this type of leg will let you level the module while you're standing up and also while you have the top of the, the track and or a level in view uh, while you're doing it. That helps make the setup of an in-track module a lot easier because you can see the module you're aligning it to or the level that you're leveling the module with. And that concludes my briefing. And I can answer any questions, or if you've got any on the uh, chat, I can do that also. So, Lee, do you glue those all as well, or do you just... I did it first, and then I kind of found out that four screws seems to hold them on quite well, and I haven't been gluing them on recently. You could, but if you ever want to take it off, it's a lot harder if they're glued. I just thought maybe for stability it might work. Yeah, four, four screws, uh, you know, on two sides of the... Uh, of the um, of the block seems to hold it in pretty well. I haven't had any problems with it. Okay, uh, you, all you have noticed that your this month's poll is up. I would ask each of you to fill it out uh, before uh, you sign off. There are six questions, so you'll have to scroll down. Um, our next month's meeting, as we said, is on March, um, April the fifteenth which is tax day, uh, same back time, same back channel. We look forward to seeing you there. Uh, remind your friends who are not uh, NREL members that they can get this stuff as it happens by uh, getting a membership with NREL. If they don't, they still have access to it 30 days later. So last month's in a Zoom track meeting is now online. And this, one, this month will be online a month from now. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we will see you all next month. Have a good week. I, I just want to mention, Razor, that, you know, this poll is really important to us. It is anonymous, and we really appreciate your taking just a few minutes to fill it out. So uh, please do complete it. And uh, you're always welcome to send your comments and suggestions to zoomtrack at nreal.org. Razor. Yes. It's, it's Dave Ferrari. Do you have any idea if any clubs are changing the name from, um, you know, such and such n track to nrail? No. And we haven't, uh, we haven't come up with a, an official position either way on that. Uh, uh, there are some clubs who, who have multiple formats, have T-Track and N-Track. Uh, there are most of the Fremos are strictly Fremo. Um, and there are some that uh, are exclusive as T-Track and some exclusive as N-Track. So we don't, it, we, uh, we don't care as far as I know, uh, so what you do, we allow all of our members to use the NREL logo as they see fit, as long as they're, don't take it, you know, don't, <laughs> don't do anything naughty. Right. Dave, Dave Richmond area N-Track. Rantrack is also using Ranrail. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we had a discussion at last night's business meeting about what, whether or not we'd want to consider it, because we don't really do much N track now. It's almost all T track. So. Yeah. Well, as Razor said, it's it's your choice. Yeah. We're going to start off with making it Northern New Jersey N track, an N rail club in. Mm -hmm.
smaller text underneath. So that sure. that gives you a lot of flexibility. You yeah. Know what you want. Sure does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else, folks? We'll see you all next month. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good show. See you next time. Hey, Bruce, I just sent you a, a chat um, in your history for N-Track. Uh, Kenny Peck was the designer of the original N-Track logo. Kenny Peck? Ken Peck. Yeah, it's in the chat. If you save the chat, it'd be. Yeah. Ken Peck, Port Huron. Okay, Ken. Yeah. He, was, he was part of the Blue Water N-Track. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks.